you say you do here? I want to introduce your new head coach. That smells like You are listening to The Review on the OSG Sports Podcasting Network. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It's another episode of The Review, the online sports guys college football podcast where we talk about news, notes, nuggets, and things left unsaid in the wide, wonderful world of college football. During the offseason, we're a bi-weekly show, which for those of you keeping track at home means we're on every other week talking about things and news and things like, um, say, the new coach at the University of Central Florida in Orlando, who's a familiar face in a new place. Gus Malzahn going down to the house of the mouse, the land of Mickey. He's the new coach at UCF. Guys, um, I don't know about you, but I think that's a great move for UCF and for Gus. And I've been coaching 30 years, and I truly believe this is one of the most excited moments I've had in my whole career. I'm honored to be the head football coach here at, at UCF. I legitimately thought that he was going to take a year off. I mean, when you've got $21.5 million in the bank, and, you know, it's like, you know, it's a, take a year off. I honestly thought he was going to go the Chiswick track. I thought he was going to take a year off, go to SEC Network, sit in the studio one or two days a week, be a pundit, and then get back in. But, you know, I guess when you want to coach and uh, folks at Central Florida are, you know, and those who cover Central Florida were sitting there and wondering if uh, Gus Malzahn was uh, worried or concerned about all the pressure that the UCF job brings, uh, legitimately said in the press conference, that was legitimately asked, um, you know, guy just wanted to coach, and he calls UCF a top twenty program, Wilkie, and I think yeah. it's two two and a half million a year for Malzahn, in addition to the twenty one and a half that he gets to spend from the planes. <laughs> so he took a he took a pay cut, in other words, huh? Yeah. Uh, well, when you got twenty one million coming your or, way, it's or, or you can it, call it, it a bonus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, you know, um, I was on the lines too that okay, maybe he'll take a year off and just cash some checks and. And, uh, you know, do some things outside of football. I know they're important to him. And, but uh, he's a coach and coaches coach. And, you know, they, they feel the itch uh, 24-7. And uh, he's, he's, he fits that mold. He's also a guy who likes to tinker with offenses. We all know that. And uh, he, he doesn't want to sit there and uh, <laughs> ball by himself at the house and just be drawing up plays for nobody. Uh, he's a coach and he, he's, he, and he wants to be with the young people, which is great. I, I, if you want to find a landing spot after uh, a few years in at Auburn, uh, this is the perfect place to really land. He's going to the, the program in the, uh, in the uh, group of five. This has been the most successful one in the best conference in the American athletic conference. So this is a perfect landing spot for, Gus Malzahn to kind of uh, rehab his career. And he does, and it's kind of like what Hugh Freeze has at Liberty now. He doesn't have to take the neck. He may go undefeated and get that get that program into the uh, group of six bowls uh, or New Year's six bowls. And uh, he doesn't have to, you know, maybe he rehabs his career where he's the hot shot again, but he doesn't have to take those jobs. Uh, he could probably spend his career in Orlando from now on and not regret it. Uh, so this is a perfect opportunity. Christy, what do you think about this nickel coverage on a third and eight? Do you think that they're, they're going to shade one way or the other? Are they going to umbrella coverage? What are they going to do with this three wide of the H back goes in motion? Yeah. That conversation is not happening at the house. Yeah, it was interesting. I read an interview with him and I don't remember which outlet did it, but one of the things that was brought up was, were you considering sitting out for the year? And he said, yeah, he said, Really, that was his initial plan. But when uh, the new athletic director at um, UCF, Terry Mohindar, came to him and said, hey, what do you think about an opportunity to come coach here? And those two have a connection because. Yeah, Mahajer was the AD at Arkansas State that hired him. Yes. And uh, yeah, that connection was uh, uh, was already there. And uh, look, um, I, I think. You know, you brought up Terry Mahajer. 
he is a, an up and coming AD. What he did at Arkansas State is it was pretty phenomenal. Uh, and he's got that program, that athletic program, not necessarily the football program, uh, elevated in such a way where you have to pay attention in, in, in the state of Arkansas about ASU. So UCF is going to benefit from that because he's going up against that UCF, Miami, Florida State, Florida, and he's had uh, that kind of uh, pressure at in Jonesboro. Um, so yeah, you drawing that conclusion, that connection uh, is perfect, Phil, because uh, they had a year together at Arkansas State, and it was a pretty successful career or year. It's a good fit, John. The pressure's different at this level. I mean, for Gus Malzahn and pretty much anybody that's coached at Auburn, it's literally, literally, it's like living in a pressure cube. And all it takes is one slight little deviation from the norm and everybody goes bananas and suddenly you're looking for a job. That's not going to happen at UCF, although the expectations there are pretty high, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> and... You know, just just ask the national champions about how how high their expectations are. You know, when you like to to say those kinds of things and you put it on the on the the big press box there at your stadium, you know, I think that it's a self imposed level of of uh, expectation. But but I think that what you want to do is you want to be a part of the conversation. You know, Josh Heupel was wanting to be a part of the conversation and when never met a microphone he didn't like when it came to discussing how he thought that UCF should be in the conversation. And then you bring in a coach with an SEC pedigree to be a part of things. And that conversation is going to be there because, you know, once again, you're bringing in someone who's been in the SEC pressure cooker, who knows what it's like to chase after a national championship. And you're putting the spotlight back on yourself for a different reason now because you're bringing it's who you brought in, not what you've done and where you want to go as opposed to what you've accomplished. Wilkie, is, uh, is that something that could get UCF over that final hurdle to get the attention that they so badly crave and that the, really the, every, anybody in the AAC or the group of five craves? Well, I, I, I think, first of all, you got to do that in state. Because again, I mentioned you got to go up against Florida, Florida State, and Miami, uh, and that's enough of a chore right there. And I think Central Florida has done a real good job with uh, with Scott Frost and with Josh Heupel to be in that conversation. They're some they're most of the time on the front page of the Orlando Sentinel, uh, so they've kind of crossed that hurdle nationally. Look, Gus Malzahn has a has a offense that. High school guys want to play in, especially quarterbacks. So he's going to have he's going to be very attractive to recruits. Uh, whether he can get a five star to come to Orlando, you know, I think that will be the next step to be able to maybe collect a few of those uh, in Florida. And if you can do that, then maybe you get an SEC team on your schedule and and you beat them. Okay, be kind of ironic if it was Auburn, right? Um, oh, or hope that yeah. you meet them. That's going to happen, though. <laughs> <laughs> or if you meet one of them in a bowl game and uh, kind of beat the heck out of them. But yeah. um, you know, you know, SEC teams just don't want to play UCF. And it's it's probably not going to happen for a while unless uh, they're totally desperate. Uh, but uh, I right now the hurdle is maintain your um, presence in Florida. Your and. Get some of the, some some of those top recruits, maybe a high four star or five star, and then see what you can do if you play the power five schools. Isn't it interesting though that he's got Dylan Gabriel, who's a pretty good quarterback in his own right, and put up some video game like numbers over the last two years in UCF after replacing Mackenzie Milton, who did exactly the same thing before he got hurt. Got Twenty yards into the end zone, contact, flag, touchdown. Yeah, and I think he's central casting for a quarterback in Gus Malzahn's system. Uh, and, you know, UCF, you know, they, you don't hear about them, but they always have really good, stable running backs. And I know that plays a big part in Gus Malzahn's o- offense is having not necessarily a home run hitter in the backfield, but someone that can get a few chunk yards, someone can, that can move the chains uh, to open up that uh, the pass. So I, you know, I think he's walking into a perfect situation as far as his, his offensive philosophy in uh, at UCF. Um, so, you know, but 
But a lot of it, too, he gets a chance to rehab his career. Uh, it's been a tough few years at Auburn, and <laughs> it's just a different animal there. John knows all about it. Mm-hmm. He's at Jordan here a lot. He yeah. hears it. Um, so he can speak more on that than I can. <laughs> but um, uh, this is a chance to get away from that pressure cooker, uh, to get to uh, Central Florida, and, uh, you know, in, enjoy some success there and rehab his career. It's interesting because having grown up in the Central Florida area, UCF was a time when I was a kid, they were, I was a commuter school. They didn't really have a football program per se. The basketball program wasn't bad, but there's a huge recruiting ground there Mm -hmm. in the Metro Orlando area um, that encompasses a large chunk of land. And the school's grown. I mean, it's you're talking about a school that's just as big, if not bigger, than a, a Florida State in terms of the amount of students who actually go there now. Yeah, it's well into the. I want to say it's in the twenty or thirty thousands. They've got a nice facility, um, state of the art, um, a good way to attract athletes there. And I think that that's a program that could. And we've talked about it multiple times here on the show. That's a program that could make the leap or if somebody, say, the Big 12 or even the ACC or somebody is looking to add another team yeah. in here in the future when we're, we're about due for another galactic reshuffling of the deck cards. Agreed. UCF's a program that could make that jump easily into the Power Five and not miss a beat. Do you agree? Oh, no question. Um. All right, so Wilkie, let me ask you this. And and when we've had a galactic reorganization and reclassification in the past, who would want to dive into the Orlando market and get a a UCF out of the American unless the American themselves think that they're pretty much that that, uh, miscongeniality right now out of the the Power Five, that they're the number six or that they're 5A? Well, the obvious answer would be the Big 12 because the SEC already has that market. The ACC already has that market. If the Big 12 wants to penetrate into Florida and in, into the Orlando market, that would be the obvious choice uh, for a Power 5 league to uh, poach uh, into the, the uh, group of five. Um, and, you know, a pretty good, decent amount of talent comes out of Florida that go to Big 12 schools. Uh, but it's just, but that's the, and, and it brings a TV market. I mean, it's a, it's a top 25 TV market as well. And you absorb Tampa, uh, in that as well. So if, if a league was going to do it, it would, I would think it'd be the big 12, but I would not, (laughs) I would look at the big 10. Now, if Jim Delaney was still the commissioner of the big 10, I would, I would probably say that would be the obvious pick, but uh, who they got right now, I don't know if he um, uh, would wants to penetrate into Florida because um, Jim Delaney was willing to go anywhere where there's a sizable TV market for the Big Twelve network for the Big Ten network. Uh, but I think the Big Twelve would be the obvious pick that that would make that move because of uh, just kind of their tenuous situation right now uh, with Texas being the big dog. Whatever happens to them, um, but I think it's the Big Twelve. Yeah, it's a, it, it's interesting because they have the resources financially to play at that level. It's just there's no there's no place for them to go. Yeah, it, well, no one wants them right now. That, that's that, there's that too. But mm-hmm. again, you uh, you phrased it the galactic yeah. <laughs> shuffling of the cards and in, in, in with conferences. Um, uh, they would be the big prize to me. But isn't there uh, a case to be made that the American is actually probably a better conference right now for football than the Pac-12? Yeah, I think that's a valid argument. Uh, and plus, they bring more TV markets, uh, especially if uh, you're negotiating a contract. I know they've got one with ESPN right now. It's not bad for a, a group of five league. Uh, they get some really good exposure out of that. And they got uh, a lot of play this year on TV. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, when you got programs like Cincinnati, which uh, people really noticed this year. I know they, uh, Phil, you were all over the Bearcats this year, uh, and uh, you weren't the only one. Uh, but it UCF has captured the imagination 
uh, back when they made their first run uh, back in uh, a few years ago with Scott Frost as head coach. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a valid argument. And I think ever since we uh, uh, restarted our podcasting about what, five, six years ago, we have been on the American bandwagon as far as being that that uh, team that should be in the or conferences should be in the power five. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, I think it's a better product football wise in the PAC 12. Yeah. The, you're not only talking about the two teams we've talked about in Cincinnati and UCF and Cincinnati, by the way, scared the bejesus out of mm -hmm. uh, Georgia in their bowl game this year Yeah, they did. Uh, before fading at the end. Yeah. Um, you're talking about a conference that has University of Houston with a big co big name coach and Dana Holerson. Um, who left the Power uh, Five school to come to to uh, UH. Exactly. And you just don't see that happen very often. Um, and you could make the argument those are three teams right there. There's, the mon there's enough money in that conference to do it. SMU's in the conference. SMU's been an up-and-coming program. Um, Navy is Navy. They always are competitive. There's a lot of cachet in the American right now, especially in the modern landscape. And I think that what we've seen with the Pac-12 and basically the fall of the Pac-12, and I know that a lot of folks would pin that on Larry Scott uh, <laughs> as, as commissioner of the Pac-12, but I think that what the, the American has grown where the Pac-12 has stagnated, if not receded, in its talent. I mean, when you have... The schools in Los Angeles who are buried on National Signing Day all the way down the board when you're used to seeing these schools, you know, in their heyday, they, you know, we talk about, we'll put that word in quotes, where you're used to seeing all of the big name schools in the Pac-12, top 25, top 30, where these days they are plummeting down the list. And you're seeing folks in the American with all of the cachet that they've been building a lot higher than a lot of other named schools out West. I think it speaks for what the American has done and what the PAC 12 hasn't done. No, I mean, USC had a pretty good recruiting year. They had a pretty good season for them. Um, and they look to be on the upswing. UCLA wasn't bad. Oregon's Oregon. And there's always going to be a power. i I think you've got a pretty good debate between the two, between the two conferences, but I like the depth in in the act i mean i didn't even mention tulsa who had a great season last year nor did i mention memphis yeah all teams that have been balancing or dancing in the top 25 over the past five years plus well it, you all, you also got programs in the uh pac-12 um that i think the unfortunate thing for them is the time zone difference yeah and where the american has the eastern yeah exactly which is, you know, why they've been playing 9 a.m. games uh, with their showcase teams on the Pac-12, which, you know, I, I think is kind of smart. Um, one of the few things that the Pac-12 has done that's been yeah. pretty, pretty smart. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see more of that. But, you know, the Pac-12 just doesn't have – they, they got to have USC to be USC again. You know, you mentioned they had a good year. Good years don't cut it. At USC, it, it has to be an 11 and 0. Um, you know, they have to beat Notre Dame. Uh, we didn't see that game this year. USC Notre Dame. That's been annual for years, and uh, so uh, Southern Cal needs to be that that program in the Pac-12 that is battling for a national championship and has got all the five-star recruits coming out of LA. And that's just not happening right now. And I think that's what's killing the Pac-12. We can mention all we can about Mario Cristobal and what he's doing in Oregon. And we all three agree that we love what he's doing up there and how he's changing the culture a little bit up there, the football culture at, at Oregon, and giving it more of an SEC culture, which I think is is going to pay dividends. But, again, it's in Eugene, Oregon. And, you know, Phil Knight is in his 80s right now, and he's not going to be around much longer. But the Nike swoosh is always going to be associated with – with Oregon. So they got that going for them. Um, so, but Southern Cal has been the traditional power and they need to be USC again, really, I think for the PAC 12 to be healthy. They showed some signs of life in 2020. They went five and zero in the conference and they played well. Uh, but yeah, they've got to sustain it over a period of time. It's 
having one good season out of 10 doesn't necessarily qualify you as being back or successful. Uh, just ask Texas about that. And when's the last time Southern Cal has had a Heisman Trophy candidate? Reggie Bush. Yeah, that's it. And that's been 15 years ago. It should be interesting. I mean, I like following the smaller the acts and the sun belts of the world. And we've talked about this a couple times over the course of the season, how much that those Hmm. group of five teams actually made an impact this season. And the pandemic probably was more kind to them than there were anybody else in college football, because you got to see just how good the American athletic conference teams, the Sun Belt teams were, and some of the conference USA teams were this year, which you would never have gotten to see otherwise. But as things become more normalized, Phil, they need to ha- maintain that, and mm-hmm. they're going to have to beat some big time schools. And we need to see those intersectional games that we saw with John's t shirt there. Um, <laughs> we need to see more of that. We need to see a, a um, a Wyoming playing a, um, um, a Troy. I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah. Um, because I think that's what made that game, uh, the, uh, BYU, um, uh, coastal Carolina game. So intriguing other than the fact that they put it together in three days. Uh, but you had two different styles and you had two successful programs. So, uh, I would, you know, maybe they, sh- the, uh, group of five needs to think of that as having an open week where they need to determine who from the mountain West and who from the Sunbelt or the Ack or, or pick a conference here, uh, are in the top 25 and say, okay, we're going to play on November 5th, mm-hmm. um, um, and have the top of the conferences do that. And I think that would create some kind of interest um, nationally. Kind of uh, some weeks at the end of the season if they need to. So they something can... like that. Yeah, just to uh, showcase your programs and get some eyes on it. I mean, that was the beauty of BYU and uh, Coastal Carolina. Uh, again, the uniqueness of uh, putting together a game in three days, flying cross country. Uh, BYU did to uh, Myrtle Beach. And what game did we have? We had a classic game. Um, you know, I think it's Zach Wilson, the quarterback of uh, of uh, BYU. That was probably the game where he had noticed most by NFL scouts and the general, the, uh, public. The general public. And now he, he could possibly be Urban Meyer's pick in the NFL draft. Um, so I would love to see... You know, think outside the box, Group of Five, because uh, you've done everything. You your your top conferences have really done everything they can do uh, to get noticed. Your Sun Belts, your Americans, uh, your Mountain Wests. Think outside the box. If you need to come up with your own playoff, do it. Your own bowl system, do it. Mm-hmm. If you want to have an open date where you have your top programs meet intersectionally. Do it because it'll it'll garner more attention than what the big boys are doing. What do you think, John? Bring it, love it, make it happen. I think we just made Wilkie the commissioner of the uh, the equivalent of the ACC Big Ten basketball challenge. I think that it, if you had, I'm seriously, if you had the Go oh. Fives, I mean, if the Go Fives went at each other, and as they as they've proven that they will, and have zero conscience about it then you want to do something like this, showcase it all. Don't think that networks wouldn't be falling all over themselves. I mean, what the four-letter was able to do with Mormons and mullets and how they took game day to Conway, South Carolina and blew it up. I mean, just when you can do something like this and just have this element to showcase the fact that, you know, here's what you're missing out on. You turn it into a recruiting tool for yourselves as well to where all of these eyes that may not necessarily have been focused on you, you're sitting there and you're drawing interest to your conference to a national database of talent. You're opening yourself up to all of this yeah. stuff if you make something like this happen. I know the, the uh, Mac has, uh, you know, you talk about Maction, yeah. great slogan, playing on Tuesday and Wednesday nights. You know, I th- that was great, but I think that that has kind of reached its uh, uh, um, its shelf life has kind of kind of gotten stale. And you you take a Buffalo playing. Uh, let's see, 
a BYU or San Diego State or something, uh, whoever uh, is at the top of the Mountain West uh, and <laughs> play it in no, mid-November in Buffalo, that'd be kind of that'd be kind of interesting. And but again, it adds to the intrigue of uh, of what they're doing. Uh, and I think it'd be a tremendous marketing tool for the for those conferences to do something like that and get get some attention. Um, think outside the box, do something, especially as we start normalizing now. Uh, and you know, hopefully this season will be more normal. Uh, what a better good. way than it to will. capitalize on all that attention you got during during the pandemic season and uh, taking it to the next level. Guys, why don't we leave this part of the conversation here as we kind of wrap up the first half of the show. And it's time for the quick marketing lesson here. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, you found us at OSG Sports. Our, our social media accounts all say at OSG Sports, Facebook, Twitter, the whole like. Um, make sure you look us up. Um, of course, OSG Nelson uh, on Twitter. Um Wilkie, are you still on Twitter? Still handcuffed. What? <laughs> I'm at OSG Phil. We've got a phone wow. app as well. Look up the OSG phone app on Google Play. Look it up on the Apple Store. You'll find us right there. Gives you an archive to all of our great content, not just college football, but oh, so, so much more. When we what come back that? in the second half of the show, we're going to talk about um, an interesting comment and topic brought up by the one and only Nick Saban regarding the college football playoff and the future of bowl games, along with a few other items that we want to get off the shelf that have happened over the last couple of weeks. Stay tuned for that and more when we come back for the second half of the review. This is the review on the OSG Sports Podcasting Network. The OSG app is up and running on your Android or iPhone. Install the OSG app and listen to our podcast from college football, soccer, and lacrosse. What are you waiting for? Download the OSG app today. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency, or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. I, I just wonder sometimes if having a playoff and bowl games. Thanks for sticking around, folks. You have made it to the second half of the review. It's the Online Sports Guys College Football Podcast, where we talk about things going on in the wide, wonderful world of college football, even though the season isn't actually going on. Oh, it is so going on. You know it is. <laughs> well, that's going to be a topic we're going to talk about here in the second half of the, sh of the second, second half of the second half. There you go. Joining me as usual, John Wilkerson, OSG Nelson, OSG Phil. We are the online sports guys. OSGJ Dub is off on assignment this week, but hopefully he'll be back with us the next for the next show here in a couple of weeks. And guys, in the first half of the show, we talked about Gus Malzahn landing in Orlando at UCF. Second half here, I want to lead off with um, an interesting quote from the one and only Mr. Nick Saban, uh, the godfather, I guess, of college football now, and pretty much two thirds of the guys who are coaching in college football. Yeah. Um, and it dates back to an interview he did last week on the Rich Eisen show. And Eisen asked him about the college football playoff and what its impact on the game has been. And the interesting part of it, to me at least, was the reaction from Saban. He basically said that the two-game playoff was interesting, but expanding to four made it a tournament 
and has kind of changed the value of the regular season and the postseason and has put all the attention on just the four-game playoff. You, you, you just wonder to yourself, can playoff and bowl games coexist? We've talked about this as topically uh, several times on our show, different episodes. Is this? A, do you guys agree with that? Do we? Is is that one of the big outstanding problems right now in college football? Well, yeah, I could be, because we've been sold that uh, they don't want to uh, hurt the integrity of the regular season and conference championships matter. Well, that's been out the window since um, they brought in. Uh, uh, I think Alabama got in one year um, without winning the, the, the championship game. Um, so that concept's out the window. Cha- conference championships don't matter. And if conference championships don't matter, what's the point of the regular season? It's just seeding for the, the, the playoff. And when you have four teams um, <laughs> out of, what, 130, uh, it's, it, the odds aren't really with you. Uh, so, uh, I, 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 I really see his point that we've kind of been sold a bill of goods that conference championships matter and they really don't, Hold uh, up. and the regular season, which, which, I mean, what, what is happening? He made a point about how it's becoming like college basketball, which is true. Uh, the, the regular season has really just become seeding for the conference tournament. And then the conference tournament is become seeding for the, uh, NCAAs. Or somehow a second chance for a, for a team that went four and twenty-one to to make it into the into the NCAA's by miraculously winning your conference tournament. Yeah. Uh, see Georgia about fifteen years ago. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I think he's made really good points. What was interesting, I thought, is he really didn't commit to any of the scenarios, oh, no. which was you know smart. I mean, Saban's a, a bright guy. Uh, he's going to roll with whatever is presented in front of him. And if he's got to play a bowl game, he's going to play a bowl game and win that. If he's going to got to do the BCS scenario, he's going to play that one game and, and win that. And if he's got to do a tournament, well, he's going to prepare his team for the, like, like an NFL playoff team would. So, uh, but I think he, since he's the guy that is the central point of college football right now, bringing these up, now the attention is starting to um, uh, go toward uh, what are we doing with the college football postseason? Well, but I mean, as the CEO of one of the most successful companies in college football, I mean, what are you going to say? You're going to say all the right things, but you're going to, in saying all the right things, you're also going to be as either noncommittal or as equally supportive, however, if you're an optimist or a pessimist, however you want to phrase it. You're going to be one of those two directions about anything that's good for your sport. And what's mm-hmm. good for your sport is making money. And so as one of the best companies that is good at making money in this business, you're going to sit there and you're going to say basically a whole lot of word salad. It's going to be a five paragraph essay that's going to involve you know gross national product and GDP and a whole bunch of things. And you're going to pull a noun here, a verb here, a predicate adjective from here, slap it all together, and you're going to come up with a statement that folks can sit there and take any number of different directions and say, well, he said this. And later on in the quote, well, he said this. It's all accurate, but all he's doing is saying what's best for business. And by doing something like that and saying all of these things that are positive about all these different directions, he's doing what's best for his business in Tuscaloosa. But, but isn't it like planting seeds? Sure. And it kind of getting the topic out there, because one of the things that stuck out to me more than anything else was the discussion. And this is a re- the reason it did is because it's something that I've advocated for several years. And that's do you need to, do we need to take a look at the at the value and the legitimacy and the reason to even play bowl games? Bowl games are programs. They, they, they are TV programs. Exactly. They, are tele, they are television programs. They are three and a half hour television programs set to satisfy network space and sponsors. But if you've got and to turn, if you've you got to turn, think that you can get your product out there and your audience is going to be best served in that three and a half hour window, whether you're a convention and visitors bureau, whether you want to bring in folks uh, to be a part of your burgeoning office and warehouse space like the. The folks that that uh, were the suburb of Chicago that sponsored the Bahamas Bowl 
And apparently they got so much business. The value of what they did in investing in that bowl game was, I mean, in the tens of millions of dollars in yeah. revenue to suggest, hey, you guys should come to the suburbs of Chicago and build your business here. If you think it doesn't matter. I mean, you could be, you know, you could be a snack food. You could be a suburb of Chicago. And if you think that what's best for your business is interacting with other businesses and hitting key demographics, that's what you're going to do. That's what bowl games are for. Bowl games sit there and draw you into warm weather, make you want a vacation in these spots. If you're a businessman looking to expand, that's where you're going, or you're going to buy more snack food, or maybe be a part of a credit union. It's Wilk, all about filling that space. But Wilkie, is this not, is this not wanting your cake and being able to eat it too? Because basically you can't do a playoff and have bowl games at the same time. It's just not feasible. It's why not? Why can't you, why can't you integrate the bowl structure into the playoff? Yeah. And, yeah. And look at the NCAA tournament. I mean, you got the NIT, you get the, I guess the CBI is still around. I don't know. You've got the, the college.net tournament, but it's uh, you don't, left in the world. they're programming. Yeah. They're there uh, for a sponsor. Or and it's programming for I think ESPN does the NIT. So when the, since they don't have the NCAA's, well they they took over that tournament, and so they got extra programming that takes them to the the end of uh, the beginning of April. And uh, so that's what those things serve as uh, eating your cake and and your your analogy there. I'm you know I, I agree with John. These are nothing but television programs that serve a purpose in December uh, because what would be there if we didn't have college bowl games uh, to watch? Uh, <laughs> there, would I mean, be something, there, would, there would be programming there. Yeah, figure skating, network ski jumping, uh, <laughs> There's never been the network downhill from Han and Common. I mean, stuff, we, stuff we grew up with, but, yeah. um, you know, what about the kids, though? I think the kids enjoy going to the Bahamas and playing a football game or, or you know, some uh, uh, MAC team going to Florida to play a, um, a bowl game. Yeah, I mean, they, they get something out of it, too. Like to Boise. But that's a TV program. <laughs> you're, you're getting, from a coach's perspective, you're getting extra practices. You're getting yeah. those 20 extra practices. So from a coaching perspective, you're going to want to go to these bowl games, even if it might be a loss leader for your program individually. You're going to want those extra practices to get you ready for the next season. But I, I still think that there's a way that you could integrate an entire playoff in, into the bowl structure as we know it. But Saban's <laughs> point also is the same teams are in the tournament every year. And I think he's got a good, I mean, he wasn't pretty noncommittal with that too. Um, but, you know, he's right. I mean, it's every year it's been Ohio State, it's been Alabama, it's been Clemson. Clemson and Alabama have been back and forth as to who wins a national title. Ohio State won it one year. Um, so Oklahoma's been in it a couple of times. Uh, so it, it's always the same programs. And that's because the, the best players are going to want to go to those programs and they get the best players, and the coaches are smart enough to coach them up. And so it's the same. We're going to see the same cast of characters from uh, now until uh, <laughs> the end of time, I guess. I don't know. The only but way the, you now, you're, now it's a delicate balance. Do you expand it to 8, 16, or do you uh, uh, revert back to the way things were back when we were growing up? I mean, this is a, you know, between this, what are you going to do with your, your postseason and the, the death of, of rivalries, these are two major issues in college football right now that um, uh, I think have really affected um, the fan bases, the interest, because um, I, I forget the, what the TV ratings were like this year for uh, the, the – it was – yeah, it was pretty – like every, good. like everything else, they were down a little yeah, bit. I think it was down like 25% or something like that. Which is about what college football has been ratings-wise this year anyway. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, – it's uh, there's some decisions that are going to have to be made pretty soon. Well, let, let me ask you guys both this, and it's something that several writers have talked about over the last year or two and probably even further back than that. Would it help the game if there was some person who actually overseed it, oversaw it, all of this and said, this is what we're doing? 
uh, a Graham Poobah, a commissioner, czar, whatever you want to call them. Well, I mean, isn't you, you'd you like to think that any kind of a czar would be out of Indianapolis, but, but, oh, but, over, but, oh, but, over time, but over time, it has been proven that the NCAA cannot be that czar. It, they have proven that they either don't want to be or they physically can't. And so I, I don't think, and that's why I think a couple of years down the line, you're going to see a version of CFA 2.0. I think when you get yeah. to the point of all of these all of these businesses who think that it's going to be better for them to negotiate television contracts individually or as yeah. a group away from the NCAA so the NCAA doesn't get their piece of the action, they're going to view themselves as businesses out on the open market. It's like, okay, who wants to negotiate with, you know, Team X? Who wants to negotiate with this team? Who wants to negotiate with this team? It's going to be the Wild West, and I think that you're only going to get something like a czar – until you get to CFA 2.0, then when CFA 2.0 shows up, you'll have some kind of a hierarchy that will look out for what's best for business. Then, yeah, when they when that Supreme Court decision came out in 1984, that's how it was structured, and it, they came to a conclusion that that wasn't going to work, and the conferences could uh, uh, would negotiate those TV contracts, uh, and uh, that's what we've gotten, we've had ever since. Uh, and back then, you had the CFA, and then you had the Big Ten. Pac-12 uh, on their uh, own uh, out doing their own thing, uh, but um, you know I I, I I agree with you, John. It, it, we may see the point where um, individual schools are going to want uh, their their own what Notre Dame has right now. Yeah, um, and um, and well, especially have- with the streaming channels coming yes. and more and more power there, I can see that happening. I also see, you know, you're talking about a grand poobah taking over college football. I think that's been something that people have wanted for 20, 25 years. Conference commissioners are not going to give up that power. I mean, they're they're very powerful in in, co- in, uh, in college athletics right now because of what they can because they they don't have to answer to the NCAA at all, uh, other than with infractions um, in college football. I mean, they handle all the TV contracts, they handle all the bowls, they handle all the playoffs. Uh, so they they don't want to give up that power. And uh, we're starting to see the new generation of college commissioners coming in uh, with uh, Greg Sankey now, the, the, uh, the leader of that pack uh, that's coming in with Jim Phillips coming to the, the ACC. And has, the that, new guy. has that autonomy not been the cause of the problem in the first place? Well, yes and no. Uh, I think you had some very egotistical guys in, in those positions um, the last few years, I mean, these were old school college administrators that have been commissioners and have been at their conferences, you know, other than uh, Mike Slive. I know, you know, you put uh, Roy Kramer and Mike, uh, Mike Slive together. Yeah. Um, and you know, to their credit, they, they created, a. <laughs> a, a behemoth in the SEC. They did. Uh, but, uh, you know. Uh, Commissioner Swaffer is getting ready to leave uh, the ACC. He's left his uh, stamp uh, with that league, promoting its college football. Uh, you've had the same with Jim Delaney at the Big Ten. Uh, and these are powerful guys that had an agenda, and they were not going to move from that agenda. And uh, they proved to be kind of the the big three of uh, of college athletics. You know, the Big Twelve has had a revolving door. Of uh, commissioners, Pac-12. Well, we yeah. all know about Larry yeah. Scott. Uh, <laughs> yes. But it could be, and it is part of the part of the problem. But let's see what these new generation guys that are coming in, uh, the Jim Phillips, the Greg Sankeys. Um, let's see how they handle things uh, going forward, because I think you're getting more of a. I don't want. I don't want more of an NBA type. Uh, guys with uh, some business savvy, uh, which uh, and they're not career college athletic guys, uh, other than the exception of Jim Phillips at, with the ACC. So I'm kind of curious to see how they handle things going forward. Guys, one more thing before we wrap it up here on this episode of the review. And there's actually college football going on right now. Yeah, man. <laughs> 
most of the football uh, championship subdivision, the FCS, the old one double A, postponed all their games in the fall due to COVID and the pandemic. They're playing their games now. Yep. Including one Mr. Dion Primetime Sanders, the head coach of the Jackson State football team. Dion Sanders getting ready for his first ball game as the head coach. Worth watching, worth tuning in. Do you think anybody even knows that they're, they're there? Outside of maybe us and a few other people? Well, I think so. I think that I think that uh, all of the TV cameras, whether they are Jackson State's or anybody else's for that matter, that are on the sideline to see Prime and Jackson State have their season. I think that he's going to be the story of the FCS season, you know, here in the spring of 2021. Uh, they had Edward Waters in Prime's debut. And I think that he's going to be one of the storylines to look at just because of him as the CEO at Jackson State. You know, how is it going to be and how are they going to, to negotiate? I mean, uh, Brian Reeves, our buddy at Austin P, they're underway. They play Tennessee Tech, Youngstown, and North Dakota State. They're going at it. New Mexico State's playing. Murray State's playing against SEMO uh, in, in this past weekend. And, you know, you're looking at – and you had some really good games, by the way. I mean, you had uh, South Dakota State and you and I at the Uni Dome that went down to the, the end. You had uh, North Dakota, you know, with their, with their game against Southern Illinois. Wofford, so you had some Southern Conference stuff. I think that – the FCS markets will be paying attention to what's going on uh, in their own individual markets. And I think that you look outside and you see what's going on in the SWAC. I think that you're going to see what's going on there and folks are going to want to pay attention. Although um, you got to feel for Lincoln University of Missouri for going to, Blue to, Tigers. To, to, to go to Thibodeau, Louisiana and take on Nichols State here in uh, the first week of uh, FCS competition. Uh, they lost 87 to 3. Well, at least they got three up. <laughs> yes, and it was in the third quarter when they were down fifty-two to nothing. So, uh, going for them, which is nice. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm afraid you're going to be seeing some results like this, but uh, you know, but I think that there are storylines that are there, and, and I think that folks are going to be paying attention in the uh, the FCS markets. Yeah, it's just a shame this is the week they opened because of the uh, the raging winter storm that went through Texas and Louisiana and, and uh, Tennessee uh, postponed a lot of those games. Uh, so it's not a full schedule of games. Um, North Dakota State, uh, by the time you hear this, uh, they will you'll know the result uh, with their game against Youngstown State. Um, you know, we, we talked about uh, the uh, pa- the group of five schools – taking advantage of COVID. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be on the same um, level with the FCS schools because it's, it's really hard to get, you get the NCAA tournament going on. Mm-hmm. We don't know what the, the, uh, the level of interest is going to be with the FCS with that going on. But I, I, I think this is a, a, a chance. And if ESPN is going to put some national games on for the Missouri Valley football conference, the, the, the showcase that, I mean, that is the SEC of F- FCS. Yeah. You've got some really, really good, great programs in that conference. Uh, and, um, you know, it, will they get the kind of exposure uh, playing uh, in the spring uh, that uh, the uh, the Sun Belts and the Mountain Wests and, uh, and, and those conferences got during the, the COVID season? You know, if so, I think this is a chance for them uh, to showcase their um, their conference and how good that conference is in college football. Guys, got anything else you want to hit on here before we wrap it up and send it on home? Nope, I'm just glad that we've got football to pay attention to, even if it is 1AA and AIA, uh, D2 and D3. Just looking forward to having football out there for the next well, couple of weeks. That's your house, dude. I know. I mean, at the same <laughs> time, uh, you know, uh, next Saturday, uh, Kennesaw State and Short are going at it. So looking forward to seeing K- Kennesaw State and what they're going to be doing as they transition to uh, the the new conference that is uh, going to be a part of FCS as well. So it's uh, as they transition out of the Big South and work their way into uh, uh, what, what's, what are they calling the new conference? But anyway, uh, they're transitioning from a Big South and they're going into another conference. And so uh, Kennesaw State and back up and running with uh, Brian Bohannon. So just looking forward to FCS and the small guys and seeing what's going on. And we need to find out when the Black Hills Brawl or the Monon Bell are being played. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, 
all stuff that you back in the old rivalries and trophy game show. It ain't old if it's still a rivalry. That's true. That is definitely true. Guys, let's go ahead and wrap things up this week. Um, thanks for sticking around, everybody. You've made it to the end of the show. Um, stick around in a couple weeks. We will be back. Uh, don't forget, if you got anything you want to see us talk about on the show or hear us talk about on the show, reach out. You can email us at osgsports at gmail.com. You can hit us up on Twitter, on Facebook. If you're subscribed to the YouTube channel, that would be even better because that means you're watching us and we would we'd like to see that. Yep. Uh, all of them at OSG Sports, really super easy to find. I'm going to give you the phone plug before John can get the phone out. We've got a phone app. Find it on Google Play and the Apple Store. It's there. It's free. Download it today. For John Wilkerson, for John Nelson, I am Bill Cantor. We are the Online Sports Guys. Thanks for listening to the review. We will catch you again in two weeks. Until then, take care and so long.